And if you start. Okay, we're recording now, Kathy, if you want to go ahead. Um, uh, good afternoon. This is the Finance Committee meeting on May 7th, and I'm Kathy Shane, Vice Chair of the committee. Bob Hegner is with us, but he's on the phone, so he can't easily see everyone. And I'm going to call the meeting to order. And my first uh, order of business in doing that is to make sure all the members of the committee can hear and be heard. So I will call out names and just let me know if all is well. Mandy? Uh, present. Bernie? Present. Andy? All is well. Uh, Bob Hegner? Present. And we're expecting Alicia to join us, but I don't see her here yet. Um, we have, in today's agenda, we have two main items with a subset of items of the second one. But the first is to hear um, um, from our annual auditor's report. And I'm going to just turn it over um, to either the finance staff who's here with us, Sandy Pooler, Jennifer, or Holly, to introduce this, and um, let Scott and uh, Scott and um, tell tell me how yeah. you pronounce your first name, Nadia, yeah. Nadia, yeah. Nadia, yeah. mm -hmm. um, take it over. And then the second item on the agenda is, and Matt is here. Uh, Matt Holloway is now. I, uh, he's Matt. Can you can you hear and hear us, Matt Holloway? Uh, I'll wait for him to fully connect. Um, so, Kathy, Andy, I see you have a question. Yeah. Yeah. The public comment was on the agenda for the first two. I don't know whether you wanted to just move it somewhere else or. Yeah, I I think you should mention when it's going it, to happen for people in the I public. I, I think since we have the guests here with us, we'll start with that and maybe we'll do public comment in between because the it, so um, of the participants, the second item is to start with any general comments or questions about the overall budget, but then a focus on the capital budget, um, the capital plan. Um, and I'm seeing a... So if people can bear with us, I mean, is, does that make sense to everyone? Um, I see one hand up of the attendees, but we're gonna do public comments in between um, right after the auditor's report. Okay, so um, the time is yours, however you're, you're planning on doing it. And Athena, have we enabled sharing screen if we're doing a share? Oh, and Paul Bachman has joined us as well. Hi, Paul. Yes, you should be able to share your screen if you wanna do slides or anything like that. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay to begin? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Scott McIntyre. I'm the, the partner in, at Markham in charge of the of the Amherst audit. Uh, with me uh, on, on the call is Ned Zaya, and I've known her for a long time. I'm not going to attempt that the last name. Uh, <laughs> Ned, Ned Zaya and I work together uh, in the execution of your 50 year 23 audit. Um, I can't recall. I think something came up at the last meeting for the finance committee, and we got we got pushed off until today. But we're happy to be here today to give you a a very quick walk through our audit of your financial statements. And in just a few minutes, I am going to uh, share my screen and walk through a a, a couple of documents, um, and hopefully uh, give you a little bit of an overview of the audit process and the results of our audit. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time looking at the financial statements because uh, there's some key numbers in there. Uh, but I think. For the most part, the committee probably is aware of the numbers. I think it's the more important communication really is how the audit went. Uh, but just before I share my screen, and I know it was said earlier, I think by Athena, um, Nadzeir and I are with, with Markham now. Um, it was all the way back in January of 2023 that Melanson uh, joined uh, forces with a national firm, Markham. I probably said this at this similar meeting a, a year ago, even though we issued your June 22 statements as Melanson. But we had joined Markham. Uh, in essence, there are so few people going into public accounting right now that we really needed to avail ourselves of the resources of a, of a bigger firm, uh, of a national firm. Um, our, we did this to maintain a presence 
in New England and particularly in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We continue to provide cities, towns, school districts with, with auditing services. Um, hopefully, you know, even improved service services uh, with additional resources. Uh, we do think that over the next couple of years, uh, we will be able to escalate the publication of many of the reports that uh, uh, have now been issued uh, on the second half of the of, of the fiscal year. We think that they could be issued uh, within six months. So with that being said, I'm going to take just a second and, and share my screen. Um, and what you should see here is you should see the the uh, on Markham letterhead dated March 26th. Um, we refer to this in, in a very common or generic sense as our, as our governance letter. Uh, what we really mean by that is it's uh, we are our professional standards require that we communicate to those charged with governance, a committee like this, um, certain things about the audit process. And that's exactly what the, this le letter does. I'm not going to walk through it in a tremendous amount of, of detail, but there are some key things in here to, to pay attention to. We're indicating we've audited your financial statements of the governmental activities, the business type activities. We're highlighting for you exactly what our responsibility is under all of the standards that we followed. We followed United States generally accepted auditing standards. We followed generally accepted government auditing standards. Oftentimes that's referred to as the, the yellow book. And we also followed OMB or Office of Management and Budget Uniform Guidance that deals with the single audits. As a recipient of federal dollars, we are required to follow the uniform guidance as, as well. Uh, towards the latter uh, top of the, the, the next page, you see we, we discuss our planned scope and timing of the audit. Um, you know, we it tells you that we did things on a test basis. We did not examine every single transaction that went through the books and, and records of Amherst. Uh, but we did things on a on a test basis. Also down here at the bottom of page two, an important couple of bullet items. Um, we identified the following significant risks of material misstatements as part of uh, your our audit planning. I'm not that that should not concern anybody because those two over those two risks, management override of internal controls in the improper revenue recognition, as the bullet items say, they are presumed risk. So it doesn't matter if it's Amherst or, or the city of Lynn uh, or the town of Lexington. You know, these risks are identified in every single audit and, they, and it's not even uh, germane only to governmental entities. In any single audit of a for-profit, non-profit or governmental entity, these are presumed risks that we must identify in, in accordance with our professional standards. And accordingly, we, we must uh, design audit steps to test to ensure that there is proper, uh, there is no management override of, in, in, of internal controls and that there is no improper revenue recognition. So at the top of the next page, you see some uh, significant audit, audit matters. And then we list a number of things. These are what we very simply call estimates that are incorporated in your, in your financial statements. I'm not going to highlight them or speak directly about them. The two that we'll talk about a fair amount when we get to the actual financial statements are your net pension liability and the related deferred outflows and deferred inflows of, of resources. Um, just know that those are those estimates are actuarially determined. And so they're based on um, not auditing standards, but actuarial standards that are, that are uh, employed in, in the in the conduct of those um, of those analyses, we talk about independence uh, and how we must be independent of, of the town of Amherst to do what we do. Um, a relatively new thing that's incorporated into this letter, uh, required by professional standards, uh, just quickly to talk about is the fact that we did perform some non-audit services as a result of our contractual relationship with Amherst. Um, Amherst, like virtually every governmental audit that we perform in the in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, we assist the town in the actual preparation of the financial statements. So that involves taking the numbers and the book your books and records that are kept in, in the general ledger, which is you know maintained in accordance with the uniform municipal accounting system, which is promulgated by the D Department of Revenue. We assist you in converting that to, in some cases, the modified accrual basis of accounting, as well as the accrual basis of accounting in order to create your government-wide financial statements. We are required, again, by our professional standards to highlight that to you, that we do this as a non-audit service. Uh, and again, it's what we do for virtually every Massachusetts government that we are, we are in, involved with. And it should not be 
um, should not be thought of as a concerning step that we we we, we do. Uh, we talk about some uncorrected and um, misstatements attached to this letter, and I'm not going to walk through them in detail. Are some proposed audit adjustments we made? They are all in a court. They are all consistent with what I indicated a minute ago, with the fact that uh, the Department of Revenue, the Division of Local Services, requires that you keep your books and records on the on, under UMIS or the Uniform Municipal Accounting System, which differs in many respects, or in, certainly in certain respects, uh, from generally accepted accounting principles. So the entries that you see there are really just very much conversion entries from the basis of accounting that you are uh, required to keep your books and records on uh, to what we call the um, accrual basis, uh, both the modified accrual basis and the accrual based fi financial statements. It's really a highlight of the what we call our governance letter. Again, the communication that's required by our professional standards to those charged with governance. Another document that I'm going to speak only very quickly about is uh, is what's up on my my screen here. It's our reports pursuant to government auditing standards and uniform guidance. Um, so there are essentially two reports in here. The first one by governing auditing standards that requires us to communicate to those charged with governance uh, if we identify any significant deficiencies or material weaknesses in your internal control structure based on the audit that we performed. And I'm very happy to report that we did not identify any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in accordance in as as defined on in, on page one of this this re, of this report. Uh, we did not identify any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies as a result of our audit work. The second report is again a uniform guidance. Again, those are the professional standards that we must follow as a recipient of, of federal dollars uh, in fiscal year 23. Uh, the, the program that we were required to test was your was your ARPA program. Uh, and so we were required to look at both the internal controls surrounding uh, the ARPA program, as well as the compliance end of things. And, and were you doing with the money everything that you said you were going to do with the money, uh, at least to, to date through the period of time of June 30, 2023. And similar to the governing auditing standards one, uh, our uniform guidance opinion on this is, is unmodified, meaning in our opinion, uh, you, you complied with the re requirements of uniform guidance as it relates to, I'm sorry, there were actually two programs in here. I, would, I should have looked down at my notes a minute ago. We were required to test the ARPA program as well as the Community Development Block Grant program in fiscal year 23. And so just to summarize again, in our report on uniform guidance indicated that there were no weaknesses in internal controls identified and there were no instances of non-compliance with the federal requirements for the fiscal year ended 2023. That takes us over to uh, really the basic financial statements. Um, and, and I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on, on, on this document uh, than I did the, the other two, uh, but really we're just gonna hit the high, high points and I'm gonna scroll down to our, our opinion. Uh, I'm gonna stop here and, and, and not necessarily scroll through the whole thing, uh, but this is, for lack of a better way of saying it, this is what you, you pay us for with respect to our audit of your financial statements. Um, based on our audit work, and again, we have, we performed our audit in accordance with the United States generally accepted auditing standards, as well as generally accepted government auditing standards. And based on our work in accordance with the, our professional standards, as you see here, our opinions, we've audited your financial statements and the second paragraph, in our opinion, and again, I'm not going to read it. It's pretty, pretty boilerplate information. It comes right to us from um, our oversight organizations, the AICPA. In our opinion, your financial statements are materially fairly presented in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles in, in the United States of America. Clean opinion. Technically, it's called an unmodified opinion. Or our opinion is without modification in that your financial statements are in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Certainly uh, nothing new there, but certainly also I look at that very much as a highlight of, 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 the, of the audit. Following the opinion uh, is what was known as MDNA or management's discussion and analysis. It puts into text and in some cases some charts, some of the results of results of operation uh, for, from fiscal year 2023. But I'm going to hop all the way over to um, the statement of net position. And um I don't think I used this term earlier, but uh, I probably have used it in the past where in this in your basic financial statements, there are essentially two sets of financial statements, both a long-term perspective and a short-term perspective. 
your statement of net position is a long-term perspective on the full, on the accrual basis of accounting. You see that, and I'm going to just my focus here is going to be on the first column of numbers, the governmental activities, which is all your governmental funds, not your enterprise funds. And you can see it has all your your capital assets included in here, and over on and you have your deferred outflows of resources related to pension and OPEB. I'll probably take questions on that should they arise. And you come over to the liabilities and and uh, net position segment of the of the statement, and you see really what what the focus will be on, on, on this statement, which is your net pension liability and your net OPEB liability. I'm not gonna walk into a lot of detail here, but in our opinion, any conversation about a local government's financial statements uh, is not complete without at least a brief understanding of these two key accounts, the, the net pension liability and the net OPEB liability. OPEB, of course, is an acronym for other post-employment benefits. And by other, they mean other than pension. And that's a long-winded way of saying what it's really getting at is retiree health care. So a couple of things to, to point out um, with your net pension liability. Uh, that's measured as of 1231-22, not, not as of 630-23, like everything else in this document. Certainly permissible retirement systems in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts have a calendar year end. So the measurement date goes back six months from your balance sheet date. And as of 6-30-23, again, with the measurement date of 12-31-2022, your governmental activities had a net pension liability of about $46.2 million. That's up about $16 million over, over the prior year. Very straightforward reason for that. In calendar year 2022, investment returns were not what plans in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts expected. So as investment earnings come in less than expected, the li liability is going to go. The liability is going to go up. Very simple relationship there. I do want to point out that um, the discount rate that uh, that the that the county system uses is about six point nine percent. That's consistent from the prior year to the to the year that's un under that we're auditing or or speaking about right now. Um, Perec does like to see that less than seven percent. Not that that's a requirement of PARAC, but I do know from conversations we've had with PARAC that they'd like to see that discount rate. Again, that's the expected future earnings of the plan, uh, something less than 7%, and you're at 6.9%. On the net OPEB liability, uh, again, that's that liability is measured as of your year end, or, or 630-23. Your governmental activities had a liability of about $78.3 million. That's really quite consistent with the prior year. Last year was about $74 million. So it's increased a little bit. That's because there was a minor reduction in, in, in the discount rate. And again, as the discount rate goes down, the liability, uh, liability will increase a little bit. I could speak uh, a lot more about the net pension and, and OPEB liabilities, as well as the related accounts called the deferred inflows of resources and outflows of resources. But when we get through going through the governmental funds and particularly the general fund, and I, I'll turn it back to the chair. And if there are, are any questions on, on pension issues or OPEB issues, I think I'll be able to, I'll do my best to answer them at that point in time. But let's hop over to you, the balance sheet for your governmental funds. Most of the focus here is going to, going to be on, on the general fund, the first column of numbers. And the focus will be down here in the, in the fund balance section. But very quickly before, before we do, I wanna point out two other major funds. The first one is your ARPA fund. Um, ARPA, of course, being the, the federal grant. And I want to point out this liability called unearned revenue of about eight eight $8.6 million. Um, accounting standards do not permit uh, the recognition of revenue until you actually do with the federal grant what it is you said you were going to do with it. So that's a fancy way of saying is when you spend the money, you will recognize the revenue. You got the cash up front, but you're not permitted to take it to revenue until you do with it what you are expected to do with it. So once you spend those dollars, this $8.6 million will move from a liability to revenue. Very simply, if you look at the entire balance sheet, you'll see that there's no fund balance. That's because revenues and expenditures will always match in this fund unless there are some interest earnings that are, that are being kept here. Uh, so there is no fund balance. That's because all of the assets are offset by a liability. It's not a liability that you have to pay back. The only reason you would pay it back is uh, if you didn't fulfill um, 
the time requirements of it. Uh, the, the money must be obligated by the end, end of this year. Uh, then if it has to be spent a few years a, after that. Only then would this become a liability that you would have to pay back. But we're not very concerned about that at this point in time. The only other one I want to point out is the capital project fund. This is new this year, uh, and it's a it's a ma major fund, um, it, and that's that's a term that's defined by the accounting standards. So you see a separate balance sheet, and if we were to flip over two pages, you would see a separate operating statement, uh, a statement of revenues and expenditures and, and changes in fund balance. So that takes us all back to the general fund, where really the balance of this communication is going to re reside. You see all your assets up here. You've got cash. You've got your receivables. You've got a prepaid, prepaid item, accounts payable, accrued payroll, amounts that are due to other funds. You've got unavailable revenues. And then you have your total fund balance of $25.7 million, which is broken down into two components. The first component is your unassigned, meaning there are no constraints on those dollars. Um, of, of $25.2 million. And that's really the starting point for calculating the town's certified free cash uh, is the unassigned fund balance. There will always be differences between unassigned fund balance and free cash, but that's really the starting point. And then you have your assigned fund balance of a little bit more than $500,000. That is essentially the encumbrances from your fiscal year 23 budget that are carried forward into fiscal year 24 and, and will be honored at that point in time. But the focus really is, uh, for most readers at least, um, I don't want to say all, but I'll, I'll say super close to all readers, is, is looking at the, the unassigned fund balance. Again, $25.2 million. A year ago, that was about $26.9 million. So it's come down about a million seven million eight. Uh, and that, that, I think, is really to, to be expected. If you think back to the fiscal year 23 uh, budget, you use several million dollars of, of, uh, of your certified free cash uh, towards to the operating budget and to your capital stabilization, uh, capital budget, not capital stabilization. Please forgive me, I misspoke there, towards, towards the capital budget. Uh, so anytime you are using certified free cash, you are essentially expecting the outflows of resources to exceed the inflows of resources. Now, if we flip over two pages, what I'd call the statement of revenues and changes in fund balance. It's really an important thing I want to want to point out here. And again, now, very much like the the balance sheet where the focus is in the on that third number up from the bottom, the uh, unassigned balance. The focus here can can also be on the third number up from the bottom. And you'll see that it's in parentheses, indicating that the outflows of resources exceeded the inflows of resources. Uh, there's some really nice disclosures in your footnotes that, that deal with this issue. I'm not going to walk through the disclosures, but I want to point this out for the, for the community and the, and, the, and the committee as a whole, is that a, a lot of focus should also exist on the difference between your revenues and expenditures. In other words, if we set transfers in and out aside for a minute, you see that you have inflows exceeding outflows of $7.5 million. And the only reason this really turns negative after transfers is because you transferred out almost $12.7 million. Almost all of that is coming over to your capital project fund. That's a highlight to me in, in, that should be, should be pointed out to readers of the financial statements that you are financing the acquisition of capital assets through a capital project fund. You're doing it with locally generated resources, that the $12.7 million that's coming over here at almost 12 million. There's a little bit more going on here, but for the most part, um, $12 million is coming out of the general fund, out of the budget, not from not from the issuance of debt, but from the budget operating budget, the revenues that are generated, $12 million is leaving the general fund and coming over here and is being committed towards capital projects. It shows good strength in, in budgeting that you can avoid going to the bond market by, by using locally generated dollars toward, towards capital. I wanted to point that out because some readers will just look at the third number up from the bottom and see that it's in parentheses. And uh, they could, I'm not saying they would, they could be concerned with that. So I, I wanted to highlight this so the community could, um, you know, refer to it and point back to what you did with the, with, with the dollars. It's not as if they were used towards operation, you know, almost essentially $12 million of it was used towards capital. So... And I think that's very much a credit strength to, to Amherst right there. So 
Um, that's really, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for, for, for a minute. Um, there's really a wealth of other information in, in the financial statements. Uh, there's, I, I talked about pension and OPEP very quickly. There's probably 15 pages of, of note disclosures that go into the various assumptions that, uh, that generate those estimated liabilities and estimated deferred outflows and deferred inflows. Um, there's also a fund balance footnote in there that talks a little bit more about your unassigned fund balance and the components of it. Uh, but I'll pause there and um, I, I'll certainly try to answer any questions that the committee may have, or if there's a desire for me to go deeper into a subject matter, I will do my best to, uh, to, to be able to do that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. And um, I'll see whether hands go up, but I also want to make sure that Matt and Alicia, who have joined us, can hear us. So Matt, could you just let us know that you can hear us and we can hear you? I'm present. Thanks, Kathy. Okay. And Alicia? I'm here. Thank you. Okay, that was a tour de force of going through <laughs> going, going through actually quite clear. So I'm I'm looking for any hands. Um and Bob Hegner, I'm not sure if you can raise your hand, so you can just shout out if you've got a question or a comment. No, no comments, no questions. Okay, I have one. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands. And it's not, it's sort of uh, your insight. We're, we're funding OPEB um, and, uh, and we're funding it I won't say generously, but we're each year it's it's a pretty big draw on our fund. How um how do we compare for with other communities in terms of what we're doing and our fund balance? Just in the middle, higher, lower. Um, and I I should have sent you that question in advance. I didn't. <laughs> um you know, with the, the pension, um, I have a better sense of what we're doing with pension because we're on our way to being fully funded, um, we've been told, and OPEB is is less so. So it's it's just a question. Um, I'm going to share my screen to, to answer the question because I think it's probably easiest. There's this disclosure... There's disclosure about your question in there. Your your the answer to your question about how you're doing compared to your peers is not in here. Okay. This, this is one of the last pages in your in your financial statements. It's called what Nazare and I refer to as RSI, or as the, the title indicates, required supplementary information. Um, in terms of how well you're 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 doing, um, what this schedule is telling you is that your total liability is 91 million. You have 12 million set aside. And your net liability is seventy nine million dollars, or that you're thirteen percent thirteen percent funded. I I would need to look at a hundred sets of financial statements to honestly answer you how you're doing compared to, you, to your your peers. Um, thirteen percent without doing that analysis, I would say that that's pretty good. Um, it, it's I've I've seen that number be close to seventy percent, but I've also in more often than not, I see that number at about 5%. So without getting, doing more homework, um, no. that's good. good. Now, there is one more thing I want to point out here that I, 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 I made a mistake a couple of years ago by being asked the same question and not turning to this schedule to point it out. But I think it's required supplementary information, but I think this is what people really want to know. It's down here in the schedule of contributions. Now, your actuary has determined that um, the ADC, as we call it, the actuarially determined contribution, is about $5.8 million. And I don't have it at my fingertips, but I suspect that what that means is you need to put in $5.8 million a year for, say, 30 years. I, I don't have it on my fingertips to know if it's 20 years or 30 years, but instinctively, I'm going to say it's 30. What you're putting in is $4.2 million, almost $4.3 million. So your contribution deficiency is a million and a half per year for 30, probably for 30 years. I'll look it up later on. And if it's something other than 30 years, I'll let the folks in, 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 the, in the administration know so they can relay this to the committee. But in my opinion, 
This is what people really want to know. The actuary says you got to put in 5.8 a year for 30 years. You're presently doing 4.3. You have a contribution deficiency of $1.5 million. That would be the delta, if you will, that if you were able to put in an additional million and a half per year for in all likelihood 30 years, then at the end of that 30 year period, you would be come fully funded. Thank you. A long-winded way of saying it, but no, I no, it, 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 that's helpful. And you know, one of the things I saw a couple of years ago is we have we have a fairly generous um, retiree package when it comes to the Medicare side. We're paying a Part B premium in a way that, at least in the private sector, I'd rarely seen. Um, you know, so it's usually just the supplemental. So, and since I'm, I don't want to go into this. I who follows Medicare, but anyway, Medicare's B premium has going, been going up. So it's um, in addition to the cost of the supplemental. Um, so we had a few years where it was flatter, but so I'm looking to see whether there were any other questions or comments. I, Bernie. Real quick, um, some congratulations are in order. Our thanks to the audit team, but our thanks to our finance staff and to Paul for uh, um, a, another remarkably good report. So, um, Athena and Paul, what I'm not remembering, um, I probably should have had instructions, but do we need to um, recommend that we accept the report um, or do we basically just accept the report? So, so is there an action finance needs to take? The finance no, 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 the council doesn't need to accept the report. The report, um, according to the charter, the report needs to be filed with the council. And then in the past, um, the council's referred it to finance committee and then finance committee just reports on the discussion that happened at the committee, but there's no other council action that's required. So I think not seeing any other comments, um, I, I actually thought, you know, your reports have always been clear, but this was a very clear report to be able to follow. So, and the presentation was, so thank you very much. Thank you. And I think that's it. So we can thank you and you can leave our meeting. Thanks. Have yeah. Thank you. So now we're turning to the larger budget questions and a focus on the capital plan, but I postponed, we postponed public comments. So I want to first see if there's anyone in the audience who would like to um, make a comment. And I see two hands are up. Um, uh, Athena, are you managing this or do you want me to? I can do that. Andy has his hand up too. So I just want to okay, check and Andy. see if he had a comment first. Okay, Andy, you're you're muted. Um, and Andy, did you want to skip your question for now? You no, it was. Uh, it shouldn't be up. I'll. Your, your hand shouldn't be up. Okay. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so that was the comment. All right, so um, Athena, we have one is a phone number and another one is a person. If you bring- um, Yeah, I, I will. Do you want to uh, do your spiel? Do I want to do my spiel? We, we're- <laughs> The public comment. Okay, I'll, I'll do spiel. my spiel. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not good at doing the spiel, but I will do it. We're, we're limiting the public comments to three minutes, and we will not be responding and interacting with them, but they will be recorded. Um, so with that said, uh, we are open for public comments, and I see two hands are up. Okay, the first one I'm going to take is a phone number ending in 0810.
you are the person 0810. You are with us if you unmute. Um, you're... Yes, I'm unmuted. I think I'm unmuted. Yes. yes. Am I unmuted? You are unmuted. We can hear you. So tell us who okay. you are. So, okay, so I just have a couple of comments. One is about the school budget, um, and I, I would urge the Finance Committee to recommend a, a 6%, um, the 6% uh, and also to um, consider strongly a gift of, of an amount um, that would uh, enable the regional schools to go forward without cutting in staff that, uh, that directly deals with students. Um, and uh, so and that, that gift would not count toward, its, toward, the, um, toward Amherst's base for the next year. It would be a one-term one gift. I think the town has given gift before. Um, it doesn't count toward the base. Um, and additionally, information, at least um, my understanding from the MMA uh, website regarding the state Senate budget is that the rural school aid that was cut by 50% by the House is uh, fully funded at $15 million by the Senate. Who knows how that will go out, but if that if the Senate version prevails, um, the, the increase in per pupil assistance that was in the House budget is, is, uh, is similar to the one in the uh, identical to the one in the Senate budget. Um, that will benefit the elementary schools by about 70 to 90 million. Um, and it will, if the rural school aid is kept in, it will benefit the regional schools by about not 90 million, but 90,000, and uh, a similar amount for the regional schools if rural aid prevails in the conference, which would then reduce the amount of, of any gift that were be given by, by the amount of the increased uh, per pupil assistance. Um, so those are those are good news from the Senate budget, and uh, something I hope that the Finance Committee will consider. Uh, finally, I think that with regard to both the regional budget and any consideration of the library project, I, I would encourage the committee to um, to hear from uh, the library trustees regarding the uh, the library project in person at a time that's convenient to the trustees. Um, and because I, I watched what happened when the four town meetings occurred in person a few weeks ago, and I, I think that the, those meetings uh, tend to be produce better results and, uh, and are more respectful of the fact that the, the body in question is, is elected and uh, I really think there should be a panel of the trustees that interact back and forth with the Finance Committee rather than giving them each three minutes to speak. And the same thing, I believe, should be the case for the Regional School uh, Committee, um, that both whatever staff and, uh, and elected representatives would speak for the Regional School Committee should be here, heard in person at a time that's convenient for the members. And I think that, that that tends to produce um, not only um, better results, but it, it also tends to produce, I think, more better informed results uh, because there are, there are just too many moving parts for someone who's not directly involved on a basis to, to understand. And I think it's good to give to have an interactive process rather than a, you know, your three minutes and then you have to listen to us talk for, for however long. So um, those are my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, just for the record, that was Vince O'Connor. He may have introduced himself at the beginning. Next is Tony Cunningham. 
Birmingham uh, District 1. Um, on the general budget, I want to encourage a recommendation to, to support the 6% budget for the regional schools. Um, as a parent of a current eighth grader and an upcoming um, rising sixth grader, I think the cuts that are being proposed will really, really devastate the quality of the education that the kids are getting. Um, as far as the capital budget goes, the financial management policy states that 10% of the property tax levy should go to capital, but you're proposing 10.5%. So I would say that's not in compliance with the town's own policies and should be scaled back. I added up the numbers in this capital budget that are for the Jones Library Expansion Project, and it's over $1.3 million. When you combine the borrowing for the town, the uh, small amount on a ban, and the CPA contribution, and so I'm hoping that project can be ended and that money can be freed up for other things. Um, the I compared FY24's projections for this year with the FY25 capital budget, and there's a lot of differences, which makes me question how the planning is done. There's very there's a lot of things in this year's capital budget that weren't even on the list last year, let alone on the on the list for FY25. A lot of numbers have gone up significantly, and there's a few new amounts that are really pricey that weren't in last year's budget at all. Um, for example, the nine hundred thousand this year and a million dollars next year for the public safety radio system replacement, and uh, five hundred thousand dollars for roof replacements, um, which doesn't specify which buildings it's for. Uh, so there's a number of things that I would question with this year's capital budget. The planning department, there's a number of amounts for studies. There's a, I, when I went back and watched one of the meetings, they talked about a third parking study, which I think is a not a good use of limited funds. We already have two parking studies. I would, I would propose a moratorium on studies until we work with the ones that we already have. Um, and then there's uh, unspent capital. Um, you don't have the updated list of unspent capital. I would really love to see not just three years old, but even newer than that, because I think there's a lot of things that have been approved in the past that haven't been spent. And I think we should be using that up before we allocate new funding, especially if it's more than three years old. And um, I think that's, oh, and roads and sidewalks, very disappointing to see that the contribution to roads and sidewalks being halved this year. So I think if the Jones project can end, um, we can up the roads and sidewalks investments again. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. I'm not seeing any other hands up, so I am closing the public comment period. Sorry, that was my timer going off. So I think we're now turning to both the overall budget and with a and then a focus on the capital budget. So I'm everyone here um, of the commit with the exception of Bernie and Matt Holloway were part of the the presentation that we had last night um, from Sandy and uh, Jennifer, the team. So I'm not sure. Uh, how best to move forward. And I know Mandy had uh, taken on herself to focus on the capital plan and with questions. I was chair of the JCPC and I also have questions. Bob was on that, um, including future years. So do we wanna start with the general budget? Um, any comments, questions on it? Um, I'm looking at the screen on faces. Do we want to have a quick repeat of last night or or jump in? I'm up open to any suggestions. I, I think we should just move on. Um, I can also just go back and watch watch the tape. Oh. And, and <laughs> Kathy, oh, Kathy, I did sit in on a lot of the meeting yesterday, so I feel pretty confident. Okay, so, so the suggestion, what we came up with when we were planning the meetings, we thought we would focus on at least one piece. So it's the um, capital improvement plan, both the coming year FY25 and then the five-year look um, in what was 
uh, provided to us. And one thing for anyone who's in the audience, also for the members here, the this there were some errors in the original um, wording of specific projects that some lists were kept from the year before that not deleted. So paying attention to the list of projects that's in the Excel, Excel spreadsheet is the FY25 list. And uh, one of the innovations in the past um, was what Tony just referred to. And we, we at JCPC did not look at that. It wasn't available but it was the updated list of capital projects approved in earlier years where there was a balance that wasn't yet spent. And that um, has not yet been updated. That is the same list we saw last year. But in the past, one of the things by looking at that, it turned out some of them could be closed out and we could move the money in to the current year capital budget. Um, so that that's a piece that I just wanted to note so Mandy, I know you had prepared questions, so I don't know whether if you want to start out and then I will um, see which things you've already raised and then I will, um, I have some as well. Yeah, um, I can. I sent my questions over to Athena and Bob on Friday. So hopefully um, Paul and that they got forwarded to Paul for some potential things, but I'll go through some of the things I looked at. Um, as I've been thinking about budgets, I pulled out um, questions about whether the capital plan meets the council financial guidelines and things about the goals, right? And so when I went through it, I did some sort of checking of some financial guidelines and said, does it meet X guideline or Y guideline? And our financial guidelines included that capital be 10 and a half percent of the levy this year. And it does meet that 10 and a half percent from our financial guidelines that we approved in December of last year, um, that it be progress on the climate goals within our capital budget for buildings and vehicles. And I saw that many of the vehicles being proposed for purchasing are hybrids or electrics or have electric uh, engine block things and and things like that for making progress on those goals. Some other things that I thought were met with the capital plan, um, explicit re recognition of instances where budget allocations reflect the manager goals, particularly with climate action goals. Um, and the, a plan for repairing and maintenance of our current buildings, including new ones with inventories of needs so that they continue to serve the community for many years. That includes the maintenance facilities fund that I think is expanding in size over the course of the budgets. Um, I'm happy to, I don't know whether Paul or any of our finance team want to just answer some of the questions I asked or I can go through them. Um, I don't know how, how the finance team wants to deal with that as we move forward. I'm happy to ask them out and see what the answers are, or they could just speak to them if they want. Yeah, so, so we just reviewed them recently. Um, Mandy just, it's, you know, Sandy was here yesterday, yesterday afternoon. So we, we may have answers, so let, we can go through them and some of them we'll, we can provide you written responses to when we have a little bit more time. Okay, um, do you wanna or just do, you... do that or do you want me to ask them specifically and then? Sure. Okay, and so I'm just going to go from the top of the document down. But Kathy? The rest of us don't have a copy of it. Bob did, so if you do it, it would be helpful. And then we'll put them we'll put them in the packet so that we have a record of what was asked. Thank you. Yep. Okay, okay, so I'll, I'll start from the top of the list. I bolded the questions on the document you got, but the first one went to a financial guideline of seeking additional grant funds to capitalize on opportunities to recruit recruit some sustainability investment. So I asked questions about some of the future replacements um, of if there were plans for certain projects that were listed in future years to apply for sustainability grants. And I specifically identified the Crocker window replacement, the EV infrastructure and vehicles and the general sustainability projects as whether there were active plans to apply for grant funding. We'd have to, I, I don't have an, we'd have to get our sustainability director and facilities to talk about specifics like the, at that level. What and the goal of this budget was to put some funds away so that when those opportunities presented themselves, we were able to actually, and they required a match, we were able to act on them pr pretty quickly. So so one of the things, Mandy, during during the meeting um, on Crocker- Sorry, hang on, hang on, Kathy. Sandy had a comment and- okay. Sandy, go ahead. 
I didn't see your hand. In the uh, in the current year budget, when we know that there's a grant available, we mark that in the plan. For the out years, we usually just identify what we put anticipate the cost of it will be. And then as we get closer to actually funding that, we then start to look at what grants might be available. So I think as Paul was indicating, Stephanie is always looking at grant opportunities and when they become more real, we then identify them. And I was just gonna um, supplement that on Crocker, we all flag Crocker. It, the JCPC focused mainly on FY25, but looking at Crocker, what we had, uh, my sense was these were placeholders because there's the hope that the accelerated repair program opens up and that the Crocker request could then be, we, the early money would help us figure out what the request is. And then we could go in because it's a series of pieces, including the HVAC system and the roof. Um, and, and so those, at least my sense is they are placeholders because we don't actually have a good sense of what the number is, but we also, there may be an opportunity depending on what the accelerated repair program looks like and when it, and it's whether we get in the queue for it or not. So that was one of the things that came out when we asked about looking forward on Crocker. So my next question is related to sort of a similar financial guideline, which was um, strong consideration for funding town municipal needs from CPA and CDBG funds. And again, looking in future years, um, there seem to be future projects that could apply for CPA or CDBG grants. And I was curious whether the intent is, but are these just placeholders again? And the ones I looked at were Crocker's Playground, the Accessible Playground, Puffer's Ponds, Restroom and Beach and Trail Improvements, the General Trail Improvements, the Civil War Tablet Display and the War Memorial and Mill River Playgrounds. So I think that we have submitted some of those. Most of the projects that went to CPA were town town sponsored projects to begin with this year. Um, I know Holly, who were you involved in the CPA pro process? And it, did we have others that didn't make the list? We we tried not we tried to match what our requests were to what what the funding was available. Can Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, I was involved in the CPA process this year, and um, I think that every year there are several projects that come to um, CPA. Uh, timing is sometimes um, a factor, but I think that they always try to look, especially for playgrounds, um, they are always trying to look towards CPA as well, but I think the intent is to keep them on the capital plan as well, so that if they don't get funded, they are still there as placeholders, yes. So I think the answer is that yes, if 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 it's something that's for eligible for CPA, we take it there. Um, but this is a way to to sort of chronicle what is on the list of sort of our to do list. And and I will say in the discussions of those, Mandy, actually every single one that you just listed, um, some of it there may be some state park grant money as well. So it was listed as. This is a rough estimate of what we think it'll cost. And the the um, Puffer's Pond Dam is an example of, we need to do a certain amount of things that there's probably money to match that money, but we have to do something first. So those out year projects were um, described as potentially eligible for CPA and or state, um, mm -hmm. which, helps, which helps in the out years. It doesn't help FY26 per se. Yep. So continuing with financial guidelines items, um, one of our guidelines was to explore possible opportunities to share equipment and facilities with neighboring communities. The field maintenance equipment, I believe, is on year two of two in terms of buying new field maintenance equipment. Um, did you explore cost sharing for the purchase of that with the region or any nonprofit sports leagues? Um, and a similar guideline was in terms of when you purchase things, the 
related costs for ongoing operating. So for field maintenance equipment, I know this was a big question last year in JCPC, uh, will it require the use of more DPW staffing, um, particularly when the statement relating to the reason to buy it is to quote, maintain athletic fields to a level that has most recently been discussed and quote, but may not actually be done right now. And what type of costs on an ongoing basis um, will those require and are they built into budgets or have we looked at cost sharing those additional operating ongoing operating costs for field maintenance when we buy the maintenance equipment with other entities, including the region or any nonprofit sports leagues that will be using those fields? I know it's complicated. You might yeah. not have an answer. Right so we now. don't we don't have a, a coherent answer on that right this moment. I think that's something we would talk with DPW about. But it's also something we're trying to respond to the need for higher higher level maintenance. You know, since if we're not going to have a a turf field, we know that the level of maintenance for the current fields has to be increased. And I think we talked about this at the time. We talked about the need for investments in our, in our fields, and that this is part of the response to that. Um, it's very complicated in terms of maintenance of fields. You know, we've it's always been a, a bone of contention because we have multiple people who are responsible. We have DPW, we have recreation, and we have schools all taking care of different parts of the actual same field, uh, which is kind of uh, crazy. Um, so um, DPW takes most of the ownership of the major fields and the major stuff, but they don't do the sidelines, for instance, and things like that. So yes, yeah, sharing information is, is sharing the get into cost sharing with the district um, on a, on a piece of equipment becomes more complicated. Although I have had a conversation fairly recently, a couple of weeks ago with Hadley about some of the things, some of the equipment that they're looking to buy that might be beneficial to us, or we could we might want to share. Um, uh, most of the time, those things um, are they're pieces of equipment that we all want to use at the exact same time. Say. But but it's but you know open to that conversation and uh, also with Sunderland, we've had those that's, conversations. That's great to hear because it kind of goes to a question. I didn't open that up to other towns, but mm -hmm. uh, vehicle purchases. I noticed a lot of our vehicles are weekly uses for same departments or different departments, but they're the same type vehicle. Have we ever explored sort of sharing amongst the departments of vehicles if they're literally used on a weekly basis of once a week? in each department to make sure that they could be used on different days so we don't have to maintain and own and purchase as many vehicles. Uh, is that something we're actively exploring? So I guess we'd have to know which vehicles we're talking about. I don't have the list in front of me, but I mean, certainly we could address that. Um, yeah. It, I think it's something to think about going yeah. forward because we do have an insane number of vehicles. I would say we do have done that to some extent, like when we bought, uh, when I was here years ago, we bought the electric vehicle for the IT department that was available for other departments in mm -hmm. town hall to use. Uh, so there are small examples like that. That's one that just happens to come to mind now. There are other larger pieces of equipment that I know um, that DPW and conservation sometimes share, but then frankly, um, the scheduling and timing of use of equipment sometimes makes it hard to share. So yes, we have done it some, and I think we do continue to think about it, but I would not suggest that that is going to make a big change in the amount of equipment that we have because um, sharing gets to be complicated. I think the Budget itself probably answers this one, but our guidelines said to provide a strategy that you should provide a strategy to meet high priority needs and that views capital investments with a climate lens. And so I just wanted to ask you to talk about the strategy that you took in viewing these capital investments in this plan with the climate lens beyond hybrid vehicle purchases or anything like that as we move forward. So, you know, I think putting together, um, we always 
look at all the at the, the climate lens on everything now. It really has been um, integrated into our thought process um, with any kind of building changes that are, that are being made, especially HVAC. Stephanie and Jeremiah, uh, they used to office right next to each other, but now they're in very tight um, communication with each other in terms of what's on the radar, what has to what has to be done, what what's um, you know what's where is fund funding available to do things. Um, so I think that we're and I, I mean, the beauty of this is our is our facility structure is 100 percent bought in on the, on moving us towards our climate goals. So I think that's it's just um, I don't know if there's a checkbox or anything like that, but they definitely are, are, are there with it. Yeah, Sandy, could, could I just give you two sp specific examples? So one is the chiller for the police department that is going to be a heat pump chiller. Um, originally, um, I don't think they were thinking about that, but as Jeremiah moved forward with the project, one of the things he pitched to us for the need for more money, not only because the original estimate was too low, but just to invest with a heat pump system so it would be more green. Uh, second, in regard to the roof replacement program, both he and Stephanie have talked a lot about um, not only repairing roofs so they don't leak, but looking at uh, re-insulating or, or making sure the insulation goes into those roof replacements when we do them. So you have to take these things on a case-by-case, site-by-site basis. But I know in the discussions leading up to this capital plan that those two specifically were talked about, uh, you know, so you can cite to people in the public for how their money is being spent. Thank you. I'm getting into a little more broader questions now um, as we go through some of the guidelines. One of our financial guidelines was to be explicit when making trade-offs where goals conflict with available resources and setting clear priorities. And in reading the CIP, I didn't really see necessarily any particular statements of any trade-offs you needed to make in terms of funding any particular projects with respect to the goals because there wasn't enough funding and things like that. So were there any trade-offs you needed to make regarding capital projects as they related to the council goals or anything? I know it's a vague and general question, but it's part of our financial guidelines is to be explicit as to what trade-offs you're making. And so I'd, I'm curious what those were. And related to that was we all know that the road funding out of cash capital decreased this year compared to other years. Um, what What is the result of reducing that funding? And I know this question is probably for a later conversation at, at town services and outreach, but what's the ultimate goal on road repairs? We have a pavement condition index map. Um, what band or rating on that map are we aiming for our roads? You know, when you say 40 million or 50 million to accomplish all road repairs, is that to get everything up to a 100 and excellent? Or is that just starting with the ones that are below X number and repairing them up to a, a, a certain pavement condition index, you know, all of that is trade-offs, but I guess that's, that's my question is talk about the trade-offs you made. You've asked a lot of questions. I think Paul, Kathy, and I could each answer some of that. I'm going to start just because I'm a big mouth. Uh, I would say <laughs> um, there, uh, there were way more capital requests and plans for spending than we could afford. So going through that process, we had continually to, to engage in trade-offs and, you know, where are we going to put money? What are we going to prioritize? So I'll give you one specific example. We have $250,000 in there for sustainability projects. And Stephanie had originally asked that to increase, uh, you know, basically by just in large picture, $100,000 a year each year for the next few years. And we said, well, we can't guarantee that. I mean, we don't have enough money to do that, but we will put 250 in each year going forward. So I think that is sort of a trade-off between money and yet uh, the commitment that the, the council had and that the manager has to sustainability. Um, God, you asked so many things. I've forgotten all the questions, Mandy Joe. Um, 
it, the big one was about trade-offs and which ones you made. And so that 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 answered, you know, a, a portion of that, but that you did discuss it oh. in JPTC. And the other one was about specifically the reduction of road funding. Um, and so, so this we, year, this year, when we had extra money, our kind of default dump in uh, account was sidewalks. So sidewalks and roads kind of go hand in hand. In the previous years, we've put ex the town has put extra money into roads. Uh, this year, the default was to put into sidewalks because, frankly, we get inundated. I'm sure you do too, with requests for both roads and sidewalks. So there was a little bit of a trade-off there. You know, could we have put it in roads just as easily? Yes. Do they go hand in hand? Yes. Um, I do think at some point. I know there's going to be discussion about the Jones and what happens with that if we don't go forward or we go forward in some other plan. And then should we dump more money into roads or sidewalks in this plan? Um, again, because none of that's decided, we're not proposing anything at this time. But I do think those are the kind of things that we're going to have to think about. So. Yeah. Oh, and, and on the PCI index, I would just say, Generally, you want to be, I don't know, at 80%. If you're at 100%, I mean, every t road is brand spanking new. Um, and there are curves you can look at for how much annual spending you have to uh, engage in in any particular year once your PCI or road index goes below a certain number. And therefore, the level of repairs you have to make to a road are much broader and more complete than if you can simply patch them and do or do an overlay or something like that. So if you're basically in the low 80s, you can do those kind of overlays and then keep things in reasonable shape. Uh, and that is generally where, um, where you wanna be. I don't happen to know what the annual dollar amount is that Amherst needs to spend to be in that area. Um, you know, I've talked to Guilford about it a little bit. I think it's a conversation to have with him in the future. Um, but uh, I do think that's also why every year we've dumped more money into roads because just the baseline that's there isn't going to be enough over the long run to keep us at, at, at that level. So those are kind of general answers. Thank you. I then looked at the budget as it relates to our goals, the performance goals that on that big Excel sheet there were, and there's a whole bunch that don't necessarily relate to the CIP, um, but I'll just go through. There were a bunch that I thought that the CIP met, um, seven or so of them using a climate lens, um, uh, reviewing and revising regulations to reduce barriers to operating businesses and proposing a whole bunch of revisions and measures to bylaws for housing, for economic development and all of that, because it had the funding for planning and, and conservation and planning for studies in them that I felt that the, that funding was going to trying to help meet the manager's performance goals on those grounds. But there were some performance goals that I wasn't sure that I thought could relate to the CIP versus other parts of the budget or just operations in general that I didn't notice or couldn't find a, a real clear use of or addressing in the CIP. And those were using a racial and social justice lens when making decisions um, and beginning to identify and propose revisions to policies, bylaws, and regulations to dismantle structural racism. Um, and so I'd like you to comment on how those goals were incorporated into the CIP, and if they weren't, how they plan to be addressed in other ways. So the big, the, I think I report every month on my goals on the seven top things that have been identified uh, by uh, CSWG, which includes the Resident Oversight Board, um, which is being funded primarily through ARPA funds. And so that uh, would not be reflected in this. Uh, maintaining the, um, you know, um, Crest Department uh, and building that into our budget, which I think we have a, we continue to build and 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 have the conversations. And the same with the DEI department. Um, you know, the outreach work we've been putting money, additional money in for outreach work from uh, the DEI department. Uh, so they have a, a little bit of a budget to work with when they're putting up, putting um, events together. 
Um, so those are the actual manifestation of the investments, right? Um, so in terms of, you know, I think, you know, we, we say that, you know, we try to in, uh, incorporate sort of the climate lens and the racial equity lens when we look at things, you know, as we start to make, but most of, you know, you know, I have not been able to really in, in, um, internalize really a, in a strong way, like choosing roads to be paved. Is there a racial equity lens to place on that? And I know intellectually, I think there is, but I have not seen a good model of how that's been done in other communities, quite honestly. So I have three more questions, two of which are probably fairly easy. Um, Look, Mandy, I just, want, first. I just want to do a comment on this because um, I think multi-use paths, sidewalks potentially fit mm -hmm. all. And I know, um, even though I didn't think it was a good idea, you grabbed a very big share of um, the community development block grant to widen a sidewalk um, that, and the designation was, it's mainly a student area, but it it, it qualifies as a low income area. So, you know, thinking about where we do sidewalks should also, it's not yeah. just roads, but where we do sidewalks. So uh, it's never been clear to me, uh, Mandy, you asked about sort of the priorities in doing this, but, yeah. you know, if we bring in a new uh, con uh, duplex development, that has low income, the quality to live there, you have to be low income to a property that has no sidewalk at all and has no pullout. Do, do we think in advance, including is there state money that would say, okay, because of where this is happening, there might be state road money. Okay. I'm just not sure how that thinking happens within the staff because- Well, it's, yeah, it's so I- pets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If I may, Kathy. So uh, that's I'm glad you mentioned that because East Hadley Road is a perfect example where it's repaved new new um, a, a new multi-use path and also a new path all the way to Groff Park, creating a better uh, walkway to Groff Park so it'd be easy access. Hickory Ridge has the the entire sort of motivation for that was to open up that space for access to the large apartment complexes on East Hadley Road and to build actual pathways, which we're working on um, through from East Hadley Road to the Hickory Ridge area, which is going to be spectacular. And just if you haven't gone up there, now's the time to go up because the, the pathways are really getting um, built in a really interesting way. Um, but we envision that as and also opening up um, West Palm, you know, Pomeroy Village area in the shops there to make it more accessible. One of the challenges for the um, East Hadley Road folks is a, is a food desert. It's really hard for them to get any place and having it be ex getting the, the sh little stores in uh, Pomeroy Village access accessible to them where they don't have to go out onto West Street and then go is one way. And then also, you know, talking with the PVTA about ac better access to the malls in Hadley is another big challenge for us. Thank you. Three more questions, two of which are fairly easy. In past years, I, I hope, um, in past years, the, the CIP has had a list of projects that aren't fundable within five years, but are on the radar. Uh, that seemed to disappear from the CIP plan. And so just if we could get that back in the plan or a supplement to the CIP of things that dropped off, you know, I, I, I can't even, I think the dam was on it at one point um, at Puffer's Pond, which now is sort of in debt schedules and stuff in other places. But, um, you know, just just keeping that list of things that are on our radar, but we haven't figured out how yet to get it in, I think is really important. Um, secondly- Can I just say- oh, Sure. That was just a matter of staff time. <laughs> I mean- I was doing the budget and the capital with 10 to 15 hours a week. And I frankly just said, all right, I'm not doing that. I just don't have time. So next year, when you have a new finance director, I'm sure it'll be back. As long as we don't lose track of it. <laughs> um, the second one is on the debt schedule. The Cropper, Crocker Farm roof seemed to be on it twice, both at 3.6 million. If you look at page 30, um, two, three and a $3.6 million borrowings on the debt schedule labeled Crocker Farm Roof or Crocker Farm Roof Replacement. Um, 
and, and there's not just, is that a duplicate? Um, one of the questions is, is that a duplicate or are, is there some thought of that the Cracker Farm roof needs two phases? Um, but the five-year plan on page nine has the Cracker Farm roof once, but at 2.6 million, not 3.6 million. And so the other question I have is, what number is the most accurate since we've got a couple of um discrepancies here are uh, what, think, what numbers are we looking at i'll have to look at the duplication issue i don't know what's going on there on the crocker farm i think what i did is i just combined two different projects because there was a roof and some hvac stuff all happening the same year and just for ease of calculating what the future debt cost might be i think i just added those two together uh, and put them all under one thing I mean, okay, so I, I do remember doing that. So three point six yeah. difference then. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the final question I asked last night um, that maybe you probably still don't have answers to, but it, it relates to the library borrowing payments that are listed in the FY twenty five section for the repayments of borrowing at one point two million. Uh, if the project, as the borrowing has been authorized, doesn't continue. Uh, at some point, we're going to need a plan for that money, both not just in FY25, but in future years, um, whether it's what to do with what's already that 1.2 million that's in the FY25 budget. If you've got thoughts as to what might happen, I know it's really there, but related to that um, is, are you going to be potentially asking for additional debt borrowing for a library repair? Um, would that debt borrowing start in FY25 such that the 1.2 million might need to stay in there for library borrowing? Um, or it, would that library repair debt borrowing, again, this is all speculation, right? Um, would that be beginning in FY26 and beyond? Uh, any thoughts you've got right now to how oh. we might be dealing with that in the process, given the CIP plan and our deadlines for voting it would be helpful, I believe. As they taught me in law school, the answer is it depends. <laughs> so um, I think there, uh, if we don't go forward, so no decisions have been made yet on the library, it's still under review. So that's second, um, if we do not go forward with the current library plan, um, it could be that we have a modification for that somewhere down the road. It could be that uh, even if, if we don't go with the current plan at all, there's still significant amount of work that needs to be done on that building. And at some point we would have to incur the cost for doing that. Whether that would be uh, something that would have to be paid for in FY25 or, or not, we don't know yet because a whole new plan would have to be. If there are no costs in FY25 related to the library, um, I would strongly recommend that you keep the money in capital and either put money toward things like roads and sidewalks, which would be a possibility, or there are a number of borrowings that we um, would plan to do next spring. And what you could do is reduce the total amount of those borrowings by that 1.3 million and borrow 1.3 million less and just pay cash uh, for some of those. In, in other words, reducing the amount you have to borrow for future borrowings with the money we have in the budget now. We do that sometimes when we do bands and we roll over just a portion of the previous year bands and pay cash. Um, or if you, if you just have cash on hand for a capital project, it's a combination of cash and borrowing. If the cash portion goes up, the borrowing portion can go down. So I, there are things we've been discussing without having made any decisions. Um, but I guess my strong recommendation is whatever is done, it stay within capital so that the town continues to invest in its capital resources. Thanks. That was the extent of my questions on capital. Then I have some, but I'm gonna wait and see if anyone else has some. Bernie, uh, this is Bob. I, I don't I don't have any questions, but I want to make a couple of comments. Okay, so that's it. 
Bernie's hands up. Bernie's hand is up. So Bob, why don't we do you, Bob, and then Bernie? Okay. So I, I, I just wanted to let everyone know that um, when the first pass through for JCPC, the, 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 the ask for financial investments or capital investments was what about five million above what we had budget for. Um, so we had to reduce that and Sandy worked very hard, very diligently with department heads to, um, to hone these uh, requests, budget requests. In many cases, they came back lower. Uh, in specific, one specific request, we had a uh, purchase of a new uh, greens mower for, for uh, the golf course that we then, it got changed to a, a, a used mower. Um, and so there were a lot of, a lot of trade-offs that were done um, both between, you know, in the minds of the people who were asking for the money, as well as, you know, amongst the the, the members of J of the um, of JCPC. So I, I I think a lot there was a, a long conversation we had about um, each of these um, each of these uh, uh, spending asks, and uh, I think we we arrived at a pretty good place. You know, for example. Uh, there was a discussion of the police cruisers, whether they could be electric. And it turned out that the, the police said, gee, we'd like it, but it doesn't really work for us for a lot of reasons. Some of it is the design of the police cruiser. There's really only uh, one manufacturer in the country that designs, that builds police cruisers, and they can do a hybrid, but they can't do electric. And the way that they're used uh, electric wouldn't work. On the other hand, um, the parking um, department, um, they their vehicle was rear-ended <laughs> and needed to be replaced. So um, they very quickly said, well, electric would be fine for that because it stays in town for 99% of its time. So the, we, we, we really looked at pretty hard at these things. Um, and uh, I, I think we had came up with a pretty good plan. The other thing I wanted to mention too is the um, the improvements on Belchertown Road are going to make it much safer for children, uh, many of whom will be in the affordable housing um, or the the children that are now in the current apartment buildings uh, will um, it'll make it much safer for them to go to school and for adults across uh, Belchertown Road. So. I think that that's certainly a case where we have, uh, whether intentional or not, um, I think there's a great benefit for the social justice. That's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Bernie. Yeah, um, a, a couple of comments and a couple of questions. Uh, uh, I'm going to have a tough time following Mandy Joe on this because she's very <laughs> thorough as usual. Um, but the the the, the 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 cost of police vehicles has really jumped from last year. Uh, I know it, we we typical cop car you want to get rid of it at a hundred thousand miles, uh, and I also know that these uh, just they aren't on a they aren't on a lot somewhere where you can just go pick one up. It takes a while to get one. Uh, so just like a to, the uh, uh, is that increase in, in police vehicles, is that purely being purely driven by production costs, by what uh, Ford's willing to sell us cars for? Uh, yeah, the police chief did report back to us based on his looking at, at costs. When we actually buy them, we will spend what it costs. In other words, if it costs less than 90,000 per vehicle, we will spend whatever the lower amount mm -hmm. is. But for budgeting purpose, he thought it was wise to put in that amount based on his conversations with uh, with Ford. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and the, the thought about uh, EV police cars are, um, police cars are designed for a variety of purposes that we don't think about, like how do you get somebody who's not wanting to get into the back seat, get into the back seat. Uh, <laughs> I didn't see in, in just, 
shifting gears. Uh, well, the other comment is about sharing equipment. Sharing equipment, in my experience, uh, is always a nice thought, but never works out. Um, I, I can understand why people would want to see it, but uh, apart from some informal sharing that might go on between highway superintendents, and I'm not saying it happens here, I've seen it in other towns, um, a formal kind of sharing agreement uh, typically tends not to be very practical because everybody needs the same stuff at the same time. Uh, looking at the public works budget, there's a, I didn't see any narrative on um, the allocation for waste processing and the allocation for stormwater management. And I'm curious as to what those purposes are. I also saw nothing about water. Um, if we look at, I want to look at a climate lens, we need to look very hard at stormwater management. Uh, every culvert is a potential disaster. Um, so I'm wondering what, uh, what what's behind those two requests. I'm Attorney, just to confirm, this is in the capital that you're looking at. And could you just remind yeah, me? Public the... Works, Public Works, Capital, uh, Facility, Waste Processing, 40,000. Um, I'm not sure what that, that's for. And then Public Works, uh, Grounds, um, Stormwater Management, uh, $100,000. So Stormwater Management can be a, a lot of different things. Uh, I'm glad to see it's there, but um, given the, you know, given the weather patterns and, and how, you know, the number of culverts we have, and the number of stream crossings we have, and streams by roads, um, that that can be very troublesome in the future. I mean, if you can't answer it now, I'll, I'll you know, I'll either, you know, pester Guilford about it but, uh, when I do the review of the highway budget or uh, you folks can get back to me another time. Well, Sandy's looking for it when Guilford presented it to us, um, when to comply with the regs we put in place that were required by the state, there was a series of things they need to do. So this was regulation driven on mm -hmm. the hundred on the hundred thousand, Bernie, but he did not go into detail on exactly what pieces that means. Um and uh you know, so I think it's a great question because one of the things I've noticed mm. is the number of drains along the roads that are completely clogged so that the water cannot run mm -hmm. into into the designated well, area. Well, yeah. Well there's a there's a couple of different things here. I mean okay. my my focus was on, um, you know, everyday roads. Yep. There's also EPA requirements, which were set aside during the previous administration that has now come back into force about um, managing wastewater from our runoff from our streets and how that gets treated. So I, it's likely that Guilford is looking at um, the EPA requirements uh, that uh, uh, will will force us to to make sure that we we've created uh, storm drains and the storm drainage system that takes care of uh, uh, surface pollutants and, and may even require treatment. Uh, yeah, it, but that's known as the MS4 permit yeah. from the EPA. Yeah. Uh, and I know uh, he did talk about the need to do various engineering studies in order to make sure that we are compliant with some of those things. Uh, and and I believe that's what that money was for. Okay, well, that's that, that's good. But that then opens up the question, my other question, which is, you know, managing stormwater in other parts of the town. And, and uh, uh, you know, have we, I, you know, have we looked at every culvert in town <laughs> and determined whether or not it's adequate, given what we're, we're seeing in flows. And, and in terms of waste processing, I know we've had some fat bird problems. I know we have, we've had uh, a couple of sewer backups. I didn't know if that was addressed towards, you know, offsetting that or, if, you know, what that what that money was for. So I'll, I'll take that up with uh, Guilford when I do the uh, uh, highway department review. The other thing I want to uh, that, that comes to mind in terms of, of groundwater and, and uh, storm management is uh, the aptly named Fearing Brook, which I know we have some studies done on, uh, which is likely pro uh, polluting uh, uh, the Fort River, but uh, that's a, that's another that's Amherst partially underground river, uh, which we're going to have to take a look at at some point. So, okay, thanks. 
So um, although I was on the JCPC committee um, and Sandy and staff did yeoman's work on trying to get us all the pieces together, one of the things that we didn't do was what you started to do, Mandy, is focus on the years beyond 25 um, on some of the items that are in it. So I, I do think we need to, especially since we're looking at a deficit going forward, you know, that um, it's not clear to me that we need to be replacing police vehicles on the same schedule that we have in the past. And I know we missed, missed a few years. So one of the questions is on hybrids, they may run longer. So as we get more experience, they've gotten better. Um, they are, as Bernie pointed out, they're expensive. So, you know, and so just trying to think through what that schedule is um, as opposed to the ask for it. So we, we skip them on a year. Looking forward, DPW this year had no vehicles on the list. Um, it had one, a sidewalk plow that for $250,000. Mandy may remember it from last year. Last year we said no, and this year we said no again. Um, so it it's right now not on the list, but I did note, note that the some of the things that are on this year's list were not on last year's list, big ticket items. Um, so I, I don't know how much all that kind of advanced planning that some of the, not eight years out or five years out, but at least two years out, we have a better sense. Um, this radio equipment um, that we needed a new base station, we needed new things to be able to talk on VHF and UHF. That wasn't on the list last year, and apparently it was in the works. I mean, they were a lot of work going on. It's fire, it's emergency more generally, but um, it it was such a big ticket item. It was start, startling to see it for the first time as opposed to what's coming to us. Um, so that was one comment on a looking forward, not just for this year. The other, the other is um, on when we're looking at this year that if we can, if staff can update the table of past things we've awarded, that um, there's about $500,000 in schools in that table. And that was current as of a year ago, it wasn't updated. So what, what we did last year with JCPC by exploring it, we still had Sonia end and Sean, but they we got people to say, we're actually not gonna use that money. We're, we're only gonna need half of it and we could grab that all. So I'm looking for ways of enhancing the road budget. Um, we, we put the, to balance the budget, Mandy, this year, we, Sidewalks was in for just 50 and we came up with another 150 to bring it up to 190. That was somewhat, do we do it in sidewalks or roads? It's, it's no matter what, it's not very much money. So I'm just thinking that we, we should be looking at that. The last comment is more on what this incredible document doesn't show you. We've mentioned a lot of things that are being funded by grants that are capital. So Bob just brought up the Bultertown Road improvements. Um, Paul, you talked about the multi-purpose road. And so maybe there's a way of that's not drawing on our cash capital or borrowing, but it's grants that were brought in to explicitly do a piece of work that would have otherwise either not gotten done at all or would have been done with town money. So maybe there is a narrative um, for that. And then I just happen to know the CDBG piece has this sidewalk piece in it. And it was, it's over, it's like four hundred and fifty, five hundred thousand dollars. It wasn't a small amount of money, but just trying. We we C CPA does some pieces, and we at least get a report on that. There might be a way of capturing it. Is all I'm asking for to show that it's not just this budget, but there's another set of money that's coming in. Um, so so th those are my comments. Um, particularly the out years. I think we had. We, when we raised questions about them, some of them were they were placeholders. You know, we don't really know how much work will have to go into War Memorial. I noticed that the Crocker Forum playground is more expensive, the whole placeholder, than what we're paying for the Fort River 
accessible playgrounds. So we, we, we're going to have a real world example of one of them that we're putting in, um, if assuming the estimates come out okay. So just trying to to at least do a two year horizon of what's really coming at us would be useful. Th those are my comments. And yeah. I don't know what to do about roads because we really need the state, this, this chapter 90 being frozen and then we get another 100,000 or 200,000, but we don't get a big kick up. And meanwhile, uh, we have a large state facility with a lot of cars that's and trucks and delivery vans that's driving on our road. So. It, it, our roads deteriorate fast because of the number of vehicles running on them. So th those are sort of observations mm -hmm. rather than a go up back and, and redo something. So if I, I just want to comment on a couple of those things, Kathy. So we typically have always prioritized um, emergency equipment in terms of the town, in terms of capital investment. And I think that we were a little caught off guard in terms of the speed with which the radio equipment came forward. Um, because I and I think what happens is sometimes put people start digging into it and then they realize what the actual numbers are. Um, the two year out planning, you know, um, I want to just recognize that we were pulling this budget together in the capital improvement program with, you know, 10 hours of Sandy for about, you know, <laughs> five <laughs> months yeah. and um, yeah. and Jen and Holly pulling things together. So recognizing that if we had a full time person in this position like we had last year uh, with a consultant that was Sonia last year, we could, we will do a lot better once that person, once that position is filled. So I just ask you for some little leeway on that in terms of what we can provide to you now. And, you know, you know, Sandy's hours are going to be taken up by this meeting. You know, you're asking him to be at four to mm -hmm. five hours of meeting a week. And that's, that's half the time he's given to us. So we want to make this these means productive. The intervening time is going to be a challenge for us. The um, past capital, usually what happens, and Holly, you can track, correct me if I'm wrong, at the end of the fiscal year, she goes through everything. And then that's when we close out accounts. You know, it's like you everybody has to come in and justify if, you, if you're allowed to keep an account open or not. And when those things come up, it usually comes back to the council in the fall. We say, here's here's some close out capital, whatever it is that we have, or and then or free cash, whatever. And then you usually do some actions in the fall, and that's where we put more money into roads oftentimes. Um, and the grant funded stuff, you know, whenever we, you're right, we do a lot, we get a lot done. Um, you know, many of these projects, the North Common, Belchertown Roads, um, Kellogg Avenue, um, all done by, by special grants that we've received. Um, we try to announce that, but we don't um, collect the information in one space. And I think that would, you know, someone with time could really pull that together. And I think, I think you'd be really impressed by that. But, and then just the other thing I think is the police replacement, the police cruisers. I think that's like, that's something we should look at. What is the, with hybrid vehicles, what is the best practice for replacing vehicles? These, this, we look at this as being something that this is, these are vehicles that have to respond in an emergency. They, you know, the, the, the employees spend eight hours or 24 hours a day in these vehicles. We want them to be, you know, I believe very firmly that, you know, office workers should have really good chairs and the, you know, people should have the right tools and really good tools to do their job on the essential pieces of their job. So, so I think those, you're raising all great points um, that we, we will keep moving on. Yeah. And I, I see Andy's hand is up and I didn't want to, um, uh, working with Sandy and your, the staff was pure joy. And we realized how much they were scrambling, but they scrambled in a way that was so responsive. Mm. Um, it, <laughs> well, it, Sandy left the picture, so he's yeah, not here. Good thing. <laughs> so we had no, we had nothing but praise. Realizing, you know, it was like coming no. in, coming in at in the middle of a process, catching up to to get everything in place. So, uh, what Sandy and his team did was pretty remarkable. Singing your praises, Sandy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I see that both Andy and Holly have their hands up. Andy. I don't know if Holly had anything to follow up on what's already been said. I had a summation thing that I wanted to make sure we include in the report. So Holly is were you Holly, responding? Holly, I think Andy is saying um you should go first. Yeah, and I was just going to um I was going to say almost exactly what Paul just said is that the closing out of capital is part of a year end process where the departments have to justify what they have left when they plan to spend it. Um I will be working on that 
very soon. Um, it is unfortunately very, very close to the end of the fiscal year <laughs> already. So I go straight from budget craziness to end of year craziness. Um, and I can try to work with either Jen or Sandy to see if we can get some updates on the outstanding capital balances, but just that they will be changing in the next couple of months anyways. So, um, you know, again, apologies for not getting to that. It was a very stressful budget season. Um, and we can we can work on that and they will be changing in the next um, couple of months. Yes, so Holly, one of the things um, as you do that, what Sonia had working with Sean said, if there's a similar purpose that we had in the next year's budget as a line, we could repurpose it. So it, you know, Paul, as I know it can all come back to cash, but that was, that helped us out last year on a couple of things where the new requests could move away because it turned out it was a school school kind of tr transfer. Um, So it was, I mean, either way is fine, but one way makes your 20 FY25 capital plan eases some of the stress in it. So it's, that's up, to staff to be thinking that out, but there were some that were there were nice there were nice matches that was in the same general um, category, so it could be repurposed rather than brought to freeze cash and then and then figure out what to do with it. So Andy, um, yeah, what I wanted to do is to make a suggestion for the final report and uh, when we write up. Um, the report to the council regarding our recommendations on the uh, CIP. And that is that uh, we there, there's been a lot of discussion today about things that were needed or that were not funded and um, that hard choices had to be made. And it gets back to this question that has been involved in our discussions for years, how much to spend on capital and how much to spend on operating. And there's always a point where there's pressure to decrease capital and in order to do something that is seen as really important at the moment for operating budget. And, uh, I think that we have known from years of experience that that's a mistake. And uh, the policy, the, the financial policy of the town is a minimum of 10%. And for the last couple of years, we've gone to 10.5 because we felt we really needed it. And because we felt that if you don't do the investment, in the short run, you, you may have a little bit more money for operations. In the long run, there's great cost that comes from postponing capital and delaying our maintenance and uh, getting into the kind of backlog that we have in so many of our buildings um, that we've just been chipping away at now. Um, and when uh, the former finance committee in the days of our town meeting form of government um, came up with a minimum 10%. The, um, at that point, we were probably around 6% of our uh, budget was uh, going to uh, capital. And we were... Uh, digging a huge hole for ourselves. And uh, the um, hard decision that um, that finance committee made was to say, we need to move it to 10% in order to get out of this. Um, and uh, it has, um, in the end, proven to be right because we're still struggling to make hard decisions on capital but at least we're um, beginning to get out of that hole we were in for many years. And um, so when we made uh, created the guidelines for the current budget process, and we, uh, as a finance committee, recommended and the council agreed to and included in the guidelines 10.5%, 
it was with that reality in mind. And I think that we need to make sure that we create a reminder right now at a time when there's a lot of pressure on uh, that we hear about that uh, we should be reducing capital. I don't think we should be reducing capital. So I'll get off my soapbox. Thanks, Andy. Um, I see Paul's hand is up and Holly, I don't know whether you had something to add or it just didn't go down. So Paul. Thanks. I just, I just wanted to mention two things. One is um, we've been preparing for our presentation to the bond rating agency, Standard & Poor's, um, this later this week. And um, the council and the finance committee have multiple audiences. And you hear from some of the audiences every night, every every time you have a meeting, people come in who we serve and uh, and we report to the, the general public and you hear about the, the need for services and requests for services. But we have other audiences too. And one of those audiences are the bond rating agencies because they're the ones who in very real terms can determine the fate of all of our capital expenditures. So as we're preparing, many things that Andy just referenced, they care about those things. They want to know the financial stability of our town and our finances. And they look at, you know, are you continuing to make contributions to OPEB? And where are you on your pension? They want to know what the liabilities are, just what you heard on the audit today. They want to know a lot about what are you doing for your capital investments? Are you maintaining that? Because a lot of communities, when they start to slide down a bad path, they start to cannibalize their capital expenditures to pay for operating costs. And that's a slippery slope. And so I think all those things, those, those core fundamental foundational things about what makes a town maintain a strong financial footing is what the town of Amherst is known for and is seen throughout the state and as having those that sort of self-discipline for making those hard choices. So that's one thing. And the second one is just a little anecdote. As um, staff was leaving, we're leaving the uh, council meeting last night, Jen turned to Holly and said, hey, I meant to tell you, I just set up the FY26 budget um, files in the on the server and Holly about lost it. But that, so we're starting to talk about FY26. <laughs> the thing. Sort of a cruel and unusual uh, <laughs> comment by Jen, but it's like where we are, we start to set up right away. Bernie. Yeah, what Paul said, um, my, uh, my little brother, used to work for Moody's and used to be one of those people that would go in and uh, tear a town's budget apart. Um, and it, it's really important that the town of Amherst, uh, people understand that the town of Amherst has to be a going concern. You have to think um, as difficult as it may be, you have to think in corporate terms and having worked long times with uh, tax exempt not for profit organizations, you still have to be a going concern. You still have to be able to retain revenues. You still have to be able to make plans to move forward and to, to cover unseen expenses. Um, there's a lot of, a lot that goes into this. And I very much appreciate the work that, you know, while I, I do have my criticisms, I very much appreciate the work that our finance team uh, and Paul does. And uh, hopefully we will have a, a new finance director before too terribly long. Um, we, we've sent Paul, a couple of a couple of referrals uh, from the committee I'm on. So um, we'll, uh, uh, we'll 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 press forward. But the the meeting with with Standard and Poor's or, or Moody's or any of the other rating agencies is very critical because if uh, that that can cause uh, we can avoid a lot of costs by having them uh, put a seal of approval on the way Amherst manages its finances. So now I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> Thanks, Bernie. Um, Mandy. Yeah, I just want to echo everything that was just said by Andy, Bernie, and Paul, and especially in terms of I, I think it's unwise if to even consider reducing capital to do operating. It's what got us into this situation to begin with back in the 08 crisis when we essentially did that. Um, and we've been digging out for a decade to at least get back into this position. And I'd I'd hate to see us go through that cycle again. Um, but I did want to say, I forgot to say at the beginning of everything I asked that I actually do, when we're comparing the capital improvement plan to the financial guidelines and to the town manager's performance goals, we basically meet them. There were a couple that obviously I had some questions about, but I do think the plan itself 
um, meets those guidelines and the goals. Um, and so in that sense, as we get towards voting later on, um, there's a, th a few things we might want to point out, but I want to thank the manager and the entire departments and all for putting forth a plan that basically does meet the financial guidelines that were adopted last year um, and the manager's goals, or at least will help the manager meet his performance goals mm -hmm. over the course of the year um, and has that thoughts, those thoughts in there. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other hands up. Um, so I, I, um, you know, other than uh, Sandy and others, you heard a couple comments on specific tables. So if there are line items that are still a duplicate, I mean, those, um, as we go in, one of the comments we made in the JCPC uh, report to the town manager, but it's clear in what was just laid out to us is that as we make decisions with some of the big cost items to fund them with debt, and as buildings come on, we're, we're squeezed even more in the out years than we would otherwise be on terms of new projects and cash capital. So as you look out across the uh, the even the five year plan, and it would look worse if we did ten years. Um, if and this is assuming if DPW we actually can get to the point there is a new DPW something because it's it's penciled in right now with a number, but that's what's starting to have a crunch. Um, so that is one of the reasons we went up to ten point five. You know the large expenditures um, to be able to get over a hump. It is absolutely putting a squeeze on operating budgets. So I don't think we should uh, put aside that. We also brought in an entire new department in the operating budget, which puts a squeeze on money available. So as we turn to the other departments, we need to be thinking these are choices we're making um, and they have consequences. So that's a what I was delighted is that we balanced FY25. It came in <laughs> two to $3 million in a deficit. So that didn't look very good. Um, and the other comment on just on praise, way back when, before I was on JCP, but I was an observer, uh, my comment was, I don't understand how we have a capital improvement plan that is balanced in year one and has extreme deficits in year two, three, four, and five. That does not look like a plan to me. That just looks like we pushed everything off, but we've gotten out of doing that. We're, we're much more disciplined in, you know, almost balanced, nearly balanced with some identification of where pieces could move. And I think that's just a huge improvement in trying to think through the future. Um, so I have to thank, it's a lot of staff that's working on that, including the departments. The departments mm -hmm. themselves are making choices. So thank you all. And I'm not seeing any other hands up. So I will see whether anyone wants to make a motion to adjourn. Could I just, could we just sure. re preview what's gonna happen on Friday? Who's coming in? Um. Uh, yes, so the Friday schedule has May, this Friday, we have, we're starting with, sorry, if I, if you don't mind. Yeah, go, go ahead, Athena. We have Sharon coming in to do the libraries at 10. Then we have Pamela Nolan Young coming at 1030 to go over DEI. We have facilities at 11, Jeremiah, Rob, and Dave, uh, the town manager budget a little at 1130. And then we'll have another opportunity for overall budget questions at the end of the meeting. Good. Thank you. And for anyone who didn't see it, um, Athena can resend it, but each of the next schools, both elementary and regional, are on Tuesday, May 14th, but there is a schedule with the departments on it um, that's been agreed on. I, and that's, that's in your packet for today, and um, Paul, I sent it out to staff, both to you and Sandy and Holly and Jen, and the staff uh, department heads who are coming to attend the meetings. Super. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Athena, the the police can't make it on the 17th. Have we rescheduled them? That's right. They're coming in at 2 o'clock on the 28th. 28th, okay. Yep, they're on the schedule for a later date. They couldn't make it on the date we had originally chosen. That's fine. 
Mandy has a hand up. Yep. Mandy has her hand up. Yeah. Um, we had projected revenues and any questions related to that on today's agenda. Is that just moving to Friday when Paul is around? I think is if that's okay with Paul, we'll do we'll do that then. Sure. As long as Sandy's here. Yeah, you know, I'm seeing that we have we have it's it's five minutes of four. So rather than opening up yeah. a new topic, Mandy, I think we'll just move it to that section. Okay. So now any and other Go Sorry, on. I should I should be raising my hand and I keep forgetting. Um, if there are questions about any of those topics for this Friday, it would be helpful to have those sooner than later so I can communicate those to the department heads so they're ready to attend the meeting. So um, I'd have to pull up my notes from the last meeting. I know Bob is doing the library. Um, I forget who's assigned the other. So I was department. assigned all the general government sections, which includes DEI, uh, the Paul stuff. And oh, well, right, that's right. Yep, so and you I sent, sent you sent those. Time, yes, thank you. Along with a whole bunch of general questions that kind of relate to revenues, but I think Kathy was doing some revenue questions too. That's right. Thank you. I had another question, which is the timings are great. Um, if we don't say take a half an hour for libraries, will we have staff there to be able to move on, or are we going to have some dead time? Like, like I, I, I know, I know there's a purpose to the timings, but I, I've not been to a, a review in a while in terms of timing that it does take so is there some leeway in that if something goes quicker yeah usually the, the department heads will come at the start of the meeting and I've, I've let them know they can just leave their cameras off until the committee is ready to um, take up their department um, and I can continue to communicate if it feels like the committee is moving through things more quickly then we can make adjustments or more slowly then we might need to move things around and we'll go and from there we had a department heads meeting this morning. We alerted the department heads about the upcoming meetings, but also that it's not their job to describe everything that's happening in their departments. It's really about answering your questions, addressing the, the key components. Um, it's not a full, like, we have four people, we have two, 32 people. That's not the point of this. So to help them, you know, having the questions in advice in advance is really helpful to sort of shape the conversation. And if I could add to that, Paul, um, I think in the past we had ha we had asked the departments to do a little bit more of that and seen their meetings with the finance committee as an opportunity to celebrate all the great things that they've done, the accomplishments that are in the budget. And so we're continuing to think about how we can do that in a different format that's not taking up this really tight timeline and yeah. finance committee. So the one exception on the list for Friday in terms of things we can look at and send questions in is the library. Um, Athena, I don't know whether we have a library budget, but if mm -hmm. if it's already in the packet, um, I'll look at it. So it's I'm not assigned to it, but just the request to get things in in advance. All the others are are in the the budget book. So. I know, what, um, I know what the line I know what the line item is for the library. Right, and then the the budget from the trustees is posted on that upcoming budget page. If you want to see that, okay, great, more detail. Yeah. And we did ask after the finance committee conversation last time. Um, members said that they didn't want a full presentation and so on. You wanted Sharon to come in and talk about um, revenues and staffing and so on. So I I shared that with her. So she's going to be ready for us okay. on Friday. So it is, yeah, and I already I already reviewed the budget. Kathy, so I, I posted some questions, so. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So now uh, I'm looking around. Does anyone have any more comments? I'm not trying to close out the meeting um, to close off discussion. If there isn't any, I make a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? I'll second. And I need to go around and do a vote. Andy? Yes. Alicia? A yes. Uh, Kathy is a yes. Uh, Mandy? Oh, Mandy? Aye. Mandy seconded. Um, Bernie? Oh, Shakespeare wrote, adjourning is such sweet sorrow. <laughs> well, I, but I agree. Matt, Matt? If Matt is still there? Well, if we adjourn, it won't matter. Okay. <laughs> and and Kathy is a yes if you didn't hear me. So I think it's unanimous that we're adjourning. Um, and we'll you have didn't the... ask me, but it's an I. I'm an I. 
Okay. Oh, Bob, I missed you. The phone, the phone down at the bottom. Sorry, Bob. Great. No problem. Hi. <laughs> it it is amazing. You don't notice there's a phone at the bottom. So <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. We are adjourned at uh, four o'clock. Thank you. Thank you.